Hello you multi. Many mates making multi memories. And thank you to Michael Fortner for that moment mention. Welcome to the Bothy, somewhere in the middle of the Irish Sea. I'm Ralphie. I'm a whiskey enthusiast. That's what I do. And I've just given this whiskey, because I've just reviewed it, 81 out of 100. What a decent mark. I used to be a bit more generous with my marks. But I'm just bringing things down a little bit. Because at times I feel I'm a bit too generous. And also I've noticed that as soon as I hit 9 out of 100, the certain retailers around the world automatically jack up their prices to speculate and cash in. And it's cynical and it's very short-sighted. And for all the additional marginal profit they make, they'll just drive customers away who start spending the money elsewhere. So it's a false economy. So, this is a delicious whiskey. It is what you call cask dominated in a very positive and favorable way. See, there's two components to the flavor of a whiskey. On one side, there's the signature from the copper stills of the malted barley spirit. And malted barley makes for a fine, delicate spirit. You see, if it was rye, it would be a really heavy, very distinctive, hard-wearing spirit that doesn't change over the years much. Even in casks, um, the, the rye absolutely dominates. But, but barley's different. Barley's a bit more like wheat, although it's got more character than wheat spirit. And it tends to kind of interact and develop com a complex relationship over time with oak casks. And when it comes to that time, the absolute sweet spot is usually between 17 and 25 years. That's when you get the best, the best results, the greatest complexity, so long as you've got an active spirit and a modestly active cask. Not too active, because you don't want too much happening to the spirit too soon and early on. And also, I might as well mention it, if you've got peated spirit, you really want to keep the integrity of the malted peated barley. So you want to use a refill cask, a secondary filled cask, where the effect over time is less dramatic and there's less cask imposition on the spirit as it's maturing, simply because you want to retain those heavy phenolic flavors. Because with those heavy phenolic flavors, you get the heavy, heavy phenolic complexity, which is why you see many peated single malts, like, uh, <laughs> let me see, what's a good example of a peated malt? Right, oh, Ardbeg, yeah, Ardbeg and Laphroaig, that'll do, that they work as 10-year-old single malts, whereas more complex, less peated whiskies, like Craig and Moore, like Glen Farkless, they're better suited to say 12 years old. Because what happens over time, particularly in more active casks, you tend to lose the phenolic integrity because it gets broken down by the process of maturation and then swamped by the influence of the flavours coming from the cask itself. Now there are exceptions to this. If you've got a young six-year-old whisky that's heavily peated, and I do mean octomore heavily peated, and it's gone into a very small active cask that's been primed with sherry or red wine, it can work wonderfully well because you've got a battle of the giants. The heavy flavours from the cask versus the heavy flavours from the spirit. And they kind of become kind of all mixed up and indistinctive and homogenised. And it's a lovely experience I recommend you go find yourself a bottle of, let me see, independent bottling of Le Chic. That'll do it for you. Or if, I, if you can afford it, a bottle of Octomore. But anyway, moving on a little bit, you will also find that 
older peated whiskies that have gone the distance over time, 20, 25 years old, they tend to mature best in almost inert casks, almost exhausted casks, because the process of maturation needs to be delicate and restrained and soft and understated. And all because malted barley spirit, and so is unmalted, say traditional Irish pot still, exactly the same, whether it be Scotch or Irish, they're predominantly malted barley spirits. So that the cask influence has a huge effect that grows exponentially over time. And traditionally, traditionally, you wouldn't get many really, really old whiskies out there, apart from old Macallans and Glen Grants and Strathylas, because very few, or Springbanks, but very few sign sign signatures could actually continue to mature and do something positive within the cask after about 30 years. Now, Glen Grant could do really well, although you don't even see that at the moment because times have changed, unfortunately. Macallan is just so far up its own backside with its own theme of, of, of bling bottlings. And I mean, I wish them well. I'm glad they're doing it because it keeps the attention away from the better quality distilleries out there. So good luck to them. I'm not, I'm not just slagging them off for it. Uh, they're doing us a favour, in fact. Um, and Strathyla, well, old Strathylas, they can be magnificent, but you've really got it. The official owner, Pernod Ricard, they're not interested in the single malts. They're only interested in their blended malt brands and getting them out there and having them as the runners-up to, to Johnny Walker. I mean, I know this sounds harsh, but I'm just telling you as it really is. Because I can, because I'm independent. Cheers. Just the way it is. Enjoy the freedom while it lasts. This one I'm going to come to shortly. I'm going to talk about the cask. With experience, you will pick up over time, and it does take time. So don't rush your journey. Take your time. You'll start to understand the way casks work. You'll understand it more. You'll understand restrained cask maturation and imposed cash maturation, cask maturation. Now, a good example of a restrained cask maturation is when you have a light whiskey like Glenfiddich, which is matured both in first fill and refill, even third fill, ex-bourbon casks because it balances out and keeps the signature of Glenfiddich single malt clear and up front. It's a, it, I mean, I really admire Glenfiddich. I really do because they're an honest brand. What you get is what you get and do you know what? They're consistent. Batch after batch after batch after batch, year after year after year, you get consistency. Other distilleries should be looking at Glenfiddich and taking a leaf out the learning book. Because seeing consistencies, this is down to poor quality casks. And what do you do if you've got a poor quality cask? You decant from it into a better quality cask. How do you get a better quality cask? Well, you look at the casks available. Refill for soft development. A fresh wet cask, wine, Madeira, Sherry, Marsala, Red Tokai, what was it, white, white Tokai, Red Rioja, the wine casks. I'm going to say something controversial here. So, put your seatbelt on, buckle up, top up that glass of whiskey. In my opinion, many French wineries have been much more consistent in investing what they need to spend in the quality of their casks than the Scotch whiskey industry has been. You see this in barriques. When you buy any whiskey that's been matured in the next barrique, you're going to get complex oak flavours because they're primarily European oak. 
American oak, you still get really good American oak. You'll find it at the Arado Adirondack Cooperage. They're using really good oak. But there's only a few cooperages in the USA that are like Adirondack, using premium American oak. It's out there and its effect is beautiful. But like everything quality, it costs money. Now, if you're, big, if you're a big corporate multinational creating watermelon versions, honey melons versions, mint versions, toffee versions, and orange versions of your bourbon, are, are you giving a damn about the quality of your casks? No, you want them as cheap as chips. But that's fries if you're in the United States. You want them cheap as chips. And that's what you get. And increasingly, I'm noticing, particularly in Scotch blended whiskey, the quality of the inferiority of the American oak wood that is being used for maturation, is, it's alarming me because it's inevitably, excuse the pun, it's going to filter into the single malts. That's the way things are going. As we gain more experience, we discover how casks work. And what really matters is when you pour a glass, smell, taste, sip, that's what matters. That's when we read the cask influence. Whether it be the delightful event, which is the Lechake Sinclair series Rioja wine, wine, red wine matured. And there's plenty of red wine in that cask, I'm telling you. But it works. Because the people making the whiskey know what they're doing. This works. Because the meat people making the whiskey know what they're doing. They've taken a bland single malt. Sorry, Spade Burn, but it's true. It's a bland single malt. And they're getting more exploratory and taking more care in getting flavour out the casks with deep toasting and a little bit of charring and when you invest in the preparation of even half decent oak it makes a huge difference in the quality of the results and we are now at the stage that even a few years ago malt mates nobody even bothered talking about the quality of the wood in the casks all it was is bourbon cask sherry cask oh my goodness surprise surprise what an exotic thing that is it's a cognac cask or a port cask red port of course Glenmorangie, of course the quinta reuben because that was one that was the first i mean my goodness that was what 2006 2007 that these finishes first appeared i mean they're, they're all over the place now but they're a very recent phenomenon. I just want to remind you of that, malt mates. My job is to keep... My, my job, one of my jobs, apart from enjoying whiskey and chatting to you, is just to kind of tell you what it was like not that long ago. And it was a very different landscape. So what, what, what am I going to conclude with? What, what, what am I really getting to with this, this particular extras monologue? It really is to remind the distillers of the importance of paying the extra money to get half decent casks and then investing with the services of a cooperage to get these casks pitch perfect for your product. Because there's no point if you put good spirit, you've spent all that money and getting a lower yield to get more flavour and you get that signature of your single malt, malted barley spirit out of your pot stills. Why waste it by putting it into bad casks? You might as well just store it in a stainless steel vat for about 10-15 years or something until some decent casks come along and then fill it. Sometimes that happens by the way. A spirit will mature, right? And it's maybe going the wrong direction. It's not bad. It's just not right. And it'll be decanted out the casks into industrial bulk containers. So while it is, and it's perfectly legal to do so, it can't age. 
It can be stored, but it cannot age. There's got to be a clear stopwatch clink on the actual aging of the whiskey. Because whiskey can only mature and gather age whilst it's in oak casks. But sometimes whiskey is stored outside of oak casks. Because if you've got a few casks leak and you don't have other casks ready, where are you going to put your spirit? You can't let it waste. I'm not judging the industry for this. They're just using practical common sense. And w to be honest, one of the problems we have is we r romanticise Scotch whisky so much and sentimentalise Scotch whisky so much, partly because of the misdirection and the fakery that comes out of some marketing departments. Honestly, never underestimate how much they will mis misdirect you and misinform you. Still banging on about the crystal clear waters cascading down through the purple heather and all that. Oh, I, I'm sick of it. I'm just sick of it. And if you're not sick of it, let me tell you, you will before too long. The more time you spend with whiskey, the more you get disinvested from the, the, the secondary flannelization of the product and the more you become invested in wanting to know the raw primary basic blueprint of how a spirit has come into that bottle. This spirit has been in some really interesting wood, primarily Spanish oak, which has been heavily charred. It certainly tastes like it. Big toffee, caramel notes, natural. No E150, it's integrity presented. That really, really does help. It takes an anonymous single mop and it puts it right off on the map. And furthermore, in the UK, it's a decent price. We're always looking for the magic formula. V equals C. <laughs> C divided by V equals C divided by Q, right? Value in relation to cost divided by the quality. Uh, another wee daft formula I've just made up. But I tell you, we examine these little formulas. We're all in the lookout. You know, forget Springbank. That's, you're, you're, chasing, you're chasing unicorns there now. You really are. Even, even though things are cooling off a wee bit at auction. Shh, I never told you. I never told you. It could be could be with the new reality of 2023 that whiskey fever is now slightly less feverish. Can I tell you from the both, eh? That's a good thing. A very good thing. I'm going to conclude this video now. Whiskey is an amazing treasure hunt. And the treasure is when we discover a new flavour from a new brand of single malt or blended malt or even blended scotch, traditional blended scotch. There's still some quality out there. I've just bought a bottle which I'm looking forward to reviewing for you later this year. Shh, not saying any more. And um, the bottom line is that we're treasure hunters and we're looking to get ahead of everybody else to go into a shop and get that bottle of whiskey which we know is good and it's a good price and it's well presented but it's off people's radar and if we can get in there first we, we, we become the treasure finders and then we can, I mean I'll review it, mention it, I mean I'm out there and all public and all the rest of it and it's great to bring bottles like this to your attention because otherwise if it was just left to marketing it just that all the messages get lost in the same script, unfortunately. Uh, and, and, you know, marketing is just an extension now of AI with all the cliches it uses. And the whiskey, Scotch whisky industry really, it really needs to completely recalibrate messaging to customers globally. 
I can see this as a very important priority coming up to 2024. Because, to be honest, the industry is looking really quite tired at the moment. It needs to be a spring clean. One of the places you start is by sweeping the floor out. Sweeping out the floor of the yesteryear reputation that your whiskey have and you just upgrade it. It's not rocket science, you upgrade it. Like Speyburn have upgraded this and now it's being found and discovered and they're selling bottles and they deserve to. Integrity mottling, 46%, unchill filtered, natural colour and you've got a blind malt, no problems. Create interesting casks. Job done. Good result. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. This tends to be my channel. I'm doing more deep dives here. I'm not doing the superficial stuff and I'm not showing you how to mix cocktails. And I'm not wandering about in tartan kilts and all the rest of it. It's not my gig. I'm here in the Bothy in, in a fisherman's jacket and an old bonnet doing what I do. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, subscribe, click like, leave a comment. And I do have a Patreon channel as well for additional content. You'll find the link below. Bye.